Great. All right. Thank you, Anna. So thanks everyone for, for being here today. So i um, quite excited that we have a couple of great speakers um, all focused on kinases today. So um, first, just like to introduce uh, Dr. Jian Jin, um, who is uh, basically had quite the rise here recently at, at Mount Sinai, wrote a, a lot of exciting work. So his title is a, a Mount Sinai Endowed Professor in Therapeutics Discovery, and he's also the director of the Mount Sinai Center for Therapeutics Discovery. So um, he's had a lot of interesting uh, sort of major uh, papers this year in cell and nature and cancer discovery that I know uh, Gary and I have been looking at quite a bit uh, recently. So uh, without further ado, I guess uh, we'll have Dr. Jin uh, start things off. Yeah. So, share my screen. Okay, so everybody can see my uh, slide, can see the screen and uh, yes. can see the laser pointer also? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Um, thanks, John, uh, for a really nice introduction. And thanks for uh, the, thanks to Gary for, uh, for the nice invitation. And it's my uh, great pleasure to have this opportunity to present our recent work, uh, recent work on discovering um, uh, uh, small molecule degraders targeting oncogenic uh, proteins. So um, um, my lab's not a kinase inhibitor lab. Um, we got in the kinase field uh, uh, may, uh, initially because our collaboration with Gary Ong developing the kind of B technology. And more recently, um, on, uh, um, because our interest um, on developing novel proteins. Okay, so here is my um, uh, uh, conflict interest disclosure. And so, um, as you know, the uh, target protein uh, uh, degradation by induced by small molecule degraders, such as polyolytic targeting chimeras of Protax, have been, uh, have been emerged as uh, uh, one of the hottest research, topic, uh, research topics in the chemical biology and drug discovery field. And, and so Protax are bifunctional molecules with one end of the molecule uh, binds to the, the protein of interest. Then the other end of the molecule binds to uh, uh, the E3 ligase ligand, ligand and, uh, and through a linker. So this induced proximity leads to uh, polybuconation of the target protein or the protein of interest and its subsequent degradation at the protein. So my lab started working on developing small molecule degraders uh, in 2014. And we started uh, uh, our work in kinase protex more than five years ago. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about, mainly talk about our, uh, our work on developing novel uh, AKT protex. And I will briefly talk about our work on um, uh, developing protex for CDK46, EGFR, MAC12 and ALK. And then I'm gonna also use uh, uh, the WDR5 as a case study to, uh, uh, to briefly talk about structure-based design of the Protex. And if I have time, I will briefly go over some of the technologies my lab developed for advancing the Protex field. So um, first, uh, AKT Protex. So this work is in collaboration with uh, Ramon Parsons lab at uh, Mount Sinai. And so this work was spearheaded by two extremely talented, talented postdocs, uh, Jia Xu uh, uh, in Ramon's lab and Xue Fen Yu in, uh, in my lab. Okay, so based on the, uh, the binary crystal structure of the um, AKT1 in complex with um, um, AZD5363, which structure shown here, which is an AKT competitive uh, inhibitor. Uh, uh, um, developed by AstraZeneca. And we designed, synthesized, and evaluated a large set of AKT degraders. And from this study, we identified uh, MS21 as a lead compound, uh, uh, as well, uh, which is a highly effective AKT degrader. So this compound contains a modified 
a binder to AKT123, and um, a ligand of E3 ligase, one hito, uh, hippo lindau VHL shown here, and joined uh, or connected by a carbon linker shown here. We also developed two negative controls and named uh, N1 and N2. So the N1 contained the same AKT and a link, uh, AKT uh, binder, binder motif and a linker, but has a diester isomer of this E3 ligase ligand, so no longer binds to the E3 ligase VHL. Then N2 has identical VHL binding portion and a linker, but with modified AKT binding portion. So this, uh, this portion has a, a dramatically reduced binding affinity to uh, AKT. So indeed, we test these compounds in binding assay first. Uh, well, these compounds displaced about five to 20 fold less uh, 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 binding affinity, uh, uh, less, uh, 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 binding affinity compared to the parent compound AZD5363. And all three compounds, well, the, uh, the MS21 and 21N, maintained high binding affinity to AKT1, 2, and 3. And as expected, N2, uh, which has modified AKT binding moiety, it no longer binds the AKT with a high binding affinity. Okay. So next, we tested MS21 in cell-based assay and found 21 degrees AKT and, 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 uh, uh, in a concentration and time-dependent manner, as shown here, with very, high, very, very, uh, very good DC50, DC50 less than 10 nanomolar as shown here. Okay, and the comp, uh, MS21 also effectively uh, inhibit downstream signaling. This is uh, uh, um, measured by phosph phosphorylation of uh, Plus 40 and phosphorylation of X, uh, S6 shown here. Okay. Then we um, um, also uh, conducted uh, mechanical action studies and found pre treatment of uh, uh, the, the cells with uh, uh, the VHL ligand, nylation inhibitor, porosome inhibitor, all the parent AKT inhibitor rescued the degradation, uh, AKT degradation induced by MS21 as illustrated here. Thus, the MS21 degrades AKT in a VHL and protozone dependent manner. We also uh, assess the selectivity of MS21. And so here showing the Western blood MS21 versus MS21N. And um, Shen Chen's lab at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and conducted mass spec based global proteomic studies to assess selectivity of this, uh, this, uh, this degrader. And we we're very happy to see this compound selectively degrade AKT1, 2, and 3 uh, out of about more than 5,000 proteins identified. Okay, so then um, we quite happy to see the MS21 actually displays the better uh, 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 cell growth inhibition of this, in, in this case, uh, colony formation assay. And, and in, uh, uh, in the two, um, uh, two cell lines, PC3 and NDA and B468 cells, both are PI3K, P10 uh, uh, mutant cell lines. And, and so it's much, much more effectively than the parent compound AZD and then electric control MS21 and shown here. And also in the P33 cells, uh, MS21 inhibit the downstream singling and, and shown here uh, and more potently than uh, AZD, uh, the parent compound. Okay. And the uh, MS21 inhibit the downstream signaling uh, more durably, as shown here, uh, than the parent compound AZD uh, uh, 63, uh, 53, 63. We also find um, MS21 induced more cell deaths uh, compared to AZD 53, uh, uh, 63, as shown here. Okay, as times go on, uh, and, and uh, the differences become more dramatic in both cell lines. Right, so next, then we conducted uh, in vivo studies and find MS21 is more, uh, well, first, um, let me show you the, the PK data. So MS21 uh, has sufficient exposure in mouse uh, plasma as shown here. And so therefore we uh, uh, conducted PK study. So this is the PC3 cell line xenograph model. And uh, uh, the um, MS21 is uh, dosed at 70 milligram per kilogram uh, and IP and AZD dosed at uh, 25 milligram per kilogram and two doses. 25 and 75 milligram. As you, as you can see, uh, MS21 
is more effective than AZD um, in inhibiting the tumor growth in vivo. And we shown here, uh, and so these are the uh, tumor samples isolated from mice treated with a compound for five days after um, two hours post last uh, um, at the last dose. And, and shown here, MS21 not only de degrade AKT and phospho AKT in vivo, also inhibit downstream signaling and more effectively than AZD. The AZD here in the sample used is the uh, 25 milligram per kilogram dose here. And we determined the drug level, uh, MS21 level in plasma and in tumor samples isolated from the uh, treated mice. And, and, uh, and shown here the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the sufficient drug levels achieved in the tumor samples and also in the plasma samples. Um, in addition to Western blotting, we also checked the total AKT levels and uh, 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 phospho S uh, uh, S6 and uh, KI67 and cleaved caspase 3 using immunohistochemistry. As shown here, the image on the right and quantification on the left. So MS21 uh, uh, significantly reduced total AKT level and uh, inhibit phospho S6 and significantly uh, um, uh, uh, suppressed uh, or reduced the KH67, which is a cell uh, proliferation mark, and have actually little or no effect on um, uh, caspase or apoptosis. Right. Furthermore, we also did an, you know, another model, uh, and so this is a, a MDA MB468 tumor um, uh, 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 cell xenograph model, and show again here MS21 is much more effective than AZD. Uh, in this model uh, in uh, inhibiting tumor growth in vivo and have no uh, significant effect in, uh, on the body weight as illustrated here, okay? So now, um, 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 I apologize for this being a very busy slide and let me explain this to you. So Ramon's lab then tested MS21 in, in 38 tumor uh, cancer cell lines and find um, um, the, uh, the basically the cell lines are grouped into two uh, main categories. So uh, uh, resistant cell lines and sensitive cell lines. Okay, so all the sensitive cell lines are uh, uh, marked uh, uh, in, uh, in blue throughout the talk and the resistant cell lines are marked in red throughout the talk, okay? And so what we found actually is quite interesting. So uh, uh, cell lines with the PI3, P10 pathway mutants tend to be highly selective to MS21, unless they also contain a RAS or RAF pathway mutants, okay, shown here, okay. So in particularly, the, you, if you look at, this is a, a, a group out of 18 or uh, 19 cell lines, they are, uh, uh, have PI3, P10 pathway mutants, but without K, uh, RAS or RAF mutants, out of 19 cell lines, 18 of them are sensitive to MS21. On the other hand, the cell lines with either mutant or uh, wild type PI3K P10 pathway, uh, uh, um, pathway shown here, these cell lines, or the cell lines with um, um, uh, um, the um, RAS and RAF mutant cell lines, they are, uh, they are resistant. And, and most of them are resistant to MS21. And, and so here um, in the resistant cell lines, and they are also resistant to uh, the parent compound AZD5363. And in the sensitive cell lines, and we actually now converting some of the cell lines re resistant to AZD5363, now they become uh, um, uh, sensitive to MS21, okay? So next, and, and we studied, we tried to understand why is that, and we found um, uh, MS21 is unable to degrade AKT effectively in most um, KRAS or BRAF mutant cell lines, as illustrated here. As I mentioned before, sensitive cell lines are marked in, uh, um, in blue and the resistant cell lines are marked in, uh, in red. In general speaking, resistant cell lines, we see the AKT degradation uh, as is much less effective AKT degradation compared to the sensitive cell lines uh, and showing, so showing you here uh, multiple examples here, okay? Then we next actually um, um, determined the AKT phosphorylation level in the uh, sensitive and resistant cell lines and find actually, uh, um, generally speaking, the, uh, the resistant, resistant cell lines shown here. Um, uh, this is quantification and 
uh, a few examples on the left and have lower AKT uh, of phosphorylated AKT levels uh, as shown here, okay? And so um, then we thought maybe if we could increase AKT phosphorylation, we potentially could increase the, uh, uh, the, de uh, the degradation of uh, AKT degradation induced by MS21. So, but first we tried to uh, uh, treat the, those resistant cells. Let's here are two examples with uh, IGF1, uh, um, which, inc which uh, inc uh, and we also show national here, where we also have a uh, treated with insulin. And treating the resistant cells with IGF1 increased uh, phosphor AKT shown here. And the co treatment and led to. A uh, uh, more effective degradation of uh, total AKT as shown here, and uh, inhibition of the downstream signaling. So now, uh, since it's known, uh, MAC inhibition would reactivate uh, RTK and subsequently reactivate AKT, we thought maybe treating with a MAC inhibitor could increase fossil AKT as well. So um, um, indeed, we found treatment with the uh, resi resistance cell lines here, showing four examples here, with a MAC inhibitor trametinib, and in a time-dependent manner, and indeed increased phosphor AKT protein level, and, and, and with that change of the total AKT level, okay. Then, uh, um, importantly, we find the, uh, uh, the co-treatment of the MAC inhibitor trametinib with uh, MS21, and led to a significant uh, 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 improved degradation of AKT uh, as shown here, and also uh, uh, improved uh, inhibition of the downstream signaling uh, uh, indicated here. Also quite exciting, we find uh, this co-treatment led to actually very significant uh, 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 the inhibition of uh, uh, colony formation in the resistant cell lines. And so here for these two cell lines, the uh, uh, the uh, was a, uh, the, the, uh, the concentration used here is a five nanomolar MS21 is one micromolar and in these two cell lines trametinib is uh, the concentration used for trametinib is 20 mic 20 nanomolar and MS21 is a three uh, micromolar so the combination this is in done in triplicate as uh, you you see here in the quantification and so this uh, um, this combination actually dramatically reduced uh, uh, the cell growth, uh, all colony formation in these resistant cell lines. Lastly, we uh, uh, analyzed actually the patient populations, um, uh, um, um, uh, cancer patient populations potential, uh, with the, uh, the PI3, uh, PI3K, P10 mutant, uh, mutants without the uh, uh, RAS and RAF uh, uh, mutants, uh, uh, mutations. So we found actually about 18% or 19% of the cancer patients um, this is done using the uh, using C by um, C bio Porter uh, Porter data uh, and the public available data database, and about 19 percent of the cancer patients uh, who has mutations in PI3 P10 pathway, but without mutation in RAS and RAF pathways, and so therefore, um, the AKT degradation uh, degraders could potentially actually treat a substantial portion of the uh, uh, cancer patients. So how I'm doing time wise. Uh, okay, so I need to hurry up a little bit. Okay, so um, in summary, um, and so for the, this part of the talk, and um, so we developed a novel, a potent and selective small molecule AKT degraders, MS21. And MS21 is superior to, a, to uh, the parent inhibitor AZD5363, which is in clinical trial, uh, uh, in clinical development, in inhibiting the proliferation of the PI, uh, the uh, PI3K P10 pathway mutant tumor cell lines, both in vitro and in vivo. And resistance to MS21 was identified, and, and mainly basically they are containing the uh, ras raf uh, uh, pathway mutants, regardless whether or not they have uh, PI3K and P10 pathway mutants. And this resistance could be potentially, uh, could be overcome by combination using the MAC inhibition, uh, combination with the MAC inhibitor, with MS21, a large percentage of human cancers have uh, the genotypes that could potentially benefit from AKT degradation therapy. Okay, right, so now very, very quickly, um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about our uh, CK46 protect uh, uh, degrader work. 
This is in collaboration with the Polycos Polycacos uh, lab at Mount Sinai. And so we discovered MS140, um, which is a, a highly effective AK, uh, the CDK46 protex. It degrades uh, CDK46 in a concentration uh, and time dependent manner. And in the, uh, in the polyzone and CRBN dependent manner, as shown here by the mechanism action studies, and it's highly selective for CDK4 and 6. This is in our, um, the mass back based proteomic studies. And MS140 blocks cancer cell growth more effectively than uh, uh, pulbocyclic, uh, which is a, 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 a FDA approved drug for uh, CDK4 and 6 inhibitor. And, and shown here, um, and, and in number of cell lines, uh, MS140 is more effective and also is more effectively reducing phosphor RB and the downstream targets as shown here, then Pobo uh, in these cell lines. Then um, MS140 also um, effective in vivo. And, and so it's effectively inhibit the xenograft uh, um, JAK1 tumor cell growth in vivo, which is a, um, a mental cell lymphoma cell line. And so here's my MS140 PK data and have a comparable uh, 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 growth, uh, tumor, tumor growth inhibition uh, between Pobo and MS140. It's well tolerated by the treating mice and degrade um, a, a, a CK4 and 6 um, uh, in vivo and inhibit phosphor RB and downstream targets. And MS140 also effectively suppressed um, um, E2F targets in vivo and, and shown here. Okay, so this is in a tumor, actually in the, in the kidney and in uh, liver samples. This actually um, 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 we don't know why, but MS140 actually was less effective uh, and then uh, um, Pobo in reducing e 2 f targets, maybe which could suggest that the compound may have actually um, improved uh, uh, toxicity of the superior window. And we also, as you know, the Pobo has a uh, um, uh, 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 cost, uh, uh, neutropenia. Uh, and so we tested this in, uh, uh, in C C56 black 6 mice. This is treated for 21 days. And well, the Pobo indeed induced uh, uh, neutropenia and well, MS140 did not, okay, shown here. And lastly, in another uh, tumor mo uh, xenograft model, this is the Colo 205 um, uh, um, cell line xenograft model, uh, MS140 also is effective in vivo and um, uh, inhibit tumor growth, reduced CK46 protein levels and inhibit uh, phosphor RB and the downstream signaling and also uh, here's uh, 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 the drug level in tumor samples. And thus we demonstrated um, um, uh, PKPD relationship in this model. Okay, so then um, next, so I'm gonna go quickly um, in our EGFR protect work. So this is in collaboration with Yuexiong's lab, we developed novel EGFR protex and shown here, one's a uh, WHL recruiting compound, one's Serbian recruiting compound. And, in, and both compounds um, um, potently degrade EGFR mutants, as shown here. Interestingly, they do not degrade wild type EGFR. Okay, so shown here. Okay, so we're currently investigating why um, these degraders selectively degrade uh, EGFR mutants over wild type EG, uh, uh, EGFR. Okay, and the compound is uh, have a, a decent PK also and suitable for in vivo efficacy studies. Then we also developed the uh, first in class MAC12 protex, this compound first, and subsequent SAR studies led to discover this is a slightly improved compound MS9434. Uh, 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 30, uh, Interestingly, um, um, the parent inhibitor we use here is an allosteric inhibitor, and it doesn't actually, based on this co crystal structure showing it doesn't have an obvious solvent exposed region, yet, we were able to convert this allosteric inhibitor uh, into effective uh, protex, even though the protex have only micromolar potency to MAC12, okay? And then uh, this compound also have uh, good PK properties and it's efficacious in vivo. This data have not been published yet. And so hopefully will be published. Uh, in vivo data of this compound will be published soon. And in collaboration with Ria Shun's lab, we also developed the first in class uh, ALK protex. And, and so uh, shown here, this was published uh, quite a few, few years ago. I'm not gonna talk about this. And so now like the last few minutes, I'm just gonna uh, quickly uh, go over 
uh, a couple of technologies on, 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 and talk about the structure-based design. Actually, you can do structure-based design for generating effective protex. So here, we uh, WDR5 is a scaffolding protein, is involved in, uh, 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 is an oncogenic driver for MML rich leukemia and uh, solid tumors such as pancreatic cancer. And small molecule uh, protein protein interaction inhibitor um, of uh, WDR5 with its binding partners have been identified. The best known compound is this compound OICR9429. Uh, uh, so, based on the binary uh, uh, crystal structure, we uh, design and uh, uh, evaluate design synthesize and evaluate a small set of the uh, uh, initial WDR5 protex. From that, we discovered this compound, MS33, which have a relatively long linker and, and, and has a, um, it's a pretty good uh, WDR5 degrader with a DC50 about 300 nanometer. And importantly, we generate the first, the high resolution crystal structure of the WDR5 protag and um, VHL elongate BC um, uh, ternary complex shown here. As you, you can see here from this co-crystal structures, the, the linker uh, uh, between the linker region between the, uh, uh, the WDR5 binding and, uh, binder and VHL ligand is relatively extended. And this actually protag induce very few interactions between WDR5 and VHL illustrated here. Based on this insight, we designed, uh, uh, we conducted structure-based design and, and, uh, and basically we reduced the linker dramatically and simultaneously enhanced the binding affinity to WDR5 and to VHL. From that study, we identified a highly effective WDR5 degrader MS67. And we also developed a nectar control, which is diester isomer. And we also generated the crystal structure of 67 WDR5 and VHL ternary complex. Again, high resolution and showing here now the 67 induced much more extensive uh, protein protein interactions between WDR5 and VHL and as illustrated here. Okay. Then um, we conducted isosomal titration calorimetry confirmed uh, uh, using this biophysical method, the uh, 67 indu uh, indeed induced enhanced binding cooperativity between WDR5 and VCP with a, a, a cooperativity value 2.74. Then the compound is highly effective of uh, degrading WDR5, highly selective and um, 67, but not OICR, highly effective in uh, um, inhibiting cell growth uh, uh, in number of tumor cells, uh, both in vitro and in this in vivo uh, PDX uh, uh, mouse model and significant per, uh, prolonged survival of the uh, treated mice and uh, um, no, no, no effect on the body weight. And we also established a PKPD relationship as illustrated here, okay? So um, um, maybe like in the last one or two minutes, and let me just quickly go over. We also developed a couple, um, um, the, um, couple uh, new technologies for advancing the protect field. And as you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there are 600 E3 ligases, but only very, very limited, limited number of them have been harnessed for generating protects, uh, with the CRBN and VHL being used most uh, extensively. So we actually demonstrated for the first time the E3 ligase uh, uh, KEEP1 can be harnessed for developing effective protects, okay, using this um, a highly, effective, highly selective and non covalent ligand of KEEP1. And so this, we generate the proof concepts uh, a compound, um, um, this compound MS683, uh, which is the BRD3 and BRD4 protag. It has actually a different kinetics. It degrades BRD4 and uh, 3 more durably. And it's also have a better, uh, and it's more selective than uh, the um, serbian and recruiting um, uh, 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 BRD234 protag D by 1. Oh, so this work expands um, expands the two, bag, two bags for targeted protein degradation. And we also developed a fully caged protex for selectively de delivering the um, protex to cancer cells then, uh, 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 then uh, compared to normal cells. And we also uh, generated optoprotex, um, which now we use a light uh, induced control of target degradation of the protein of interest. And this work is published here, so I'm not gonna talk about this. Um, 
to, um, um, further. So lastly, let me just uh, uh, thank our uh, collaborators, um, Ramon's lab for uh, the uh, AKT Protex, Polycos lab for CDK46, and Yuexiong's lab at UNC for EGFR and ALK Protex, and Greg Wang's lab at UNC for WDR5 Protex, and Folate, Folate and Opto Protex uh, um, work for uh, uh, Wei Yi Wei's lab at Harvard for, the, for this work, and Shen Chen's lab did a lot of uh, mass spec proteomic studies for our studies. And lastly, and, and I'd like to thank my lab members. And, and so this is one of our Zoom meeting and conducted uh, end of last year. And, and so our current member, members and our funding agency, uh, fund, funding support uh, and, and, and to the uh, funding agency for the financial support. Lastly, uh, but not least, thank you very much. So let me stop sharing and then... Um, all right, thanks, Jen. That was uh, <clears throat> some stuff there. Very cool. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Dr. David Drury. So uh, David's an associate professor in the Stru Structural Genomics Consortium at UNC in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, he worked at GSK for 25 years before coming to UNC maybe six years ago, I, I think. Um, and he's a, a leader in medicinal chemistry of protein kinases and a, a huge resource here at UNC and, and beyond. Uh, and his work, uh, such as the development to the kinase chemogenomic set, the KCGS, uh, has really enabled a lot of unique kinase-related biology work in, in many labs. So I'm um, happy to uh, hear what we can from David here. So uh, David, are you connected? Yes, just one second. Let me- No problem. Get my- Great, I, we can see it, I think, so. Oh, we see the presenter mode in this. Excellent, looks good. Go ahead. All right, so uh, thank you for the invitation. And what I'd like to do today is, is talk to you about the, the, our kinase chemogenomic set, uh, what it is, how we built it, and, and ways that it is useful. So I'll jump right in. Uh, I like to use this first slide just to convince people that kinases are an important drug target. And here what you see is 75 approved kinase inhibitors over the last, basically starting since the turn of the century. And, and about 40 compounds have been approved in the last five years. So what's clear is that kinases are druggable. Uh, the medicinal chemistry and oncology community know how to um, develop compounds for these. And, and it's, it's a fruitful area for work. What's interesting, however, as you see in this slide, is that actually we, we ignore much of the kinome. And, and actually what's, what's also true is we ignore much of the genome. We tend to work on targets that other people work on. And this simple plot here shows publications uh, really for 20% for of or so of the kinome cover most of the kinase publications. Um, you might say, well, maybe we've chosen wisely and that we've chosen this top 20% and that's what's given us these drugs and these really are the best targets. But there are plenty of papers out there and I highlight this paper in, below the clinical kinase index that suggests that there are many very interesting potential drug targets in the understudied kinases. And of course, this is the, the genesis of this, this whole IDG program. And so we, we need to continue to work in, in the kinase space. Uh, so one way to do that would be to develop a, a, a chemical probe for each and every one of the 500 or so kinases. Uh, that is probably doable, but it's a tall order and it will take a long time. So it is one of the, 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 the areas where our group works. And here I show you that same plot of, of kinases and publication. And I show some 
some specific kinases with green arrows pointing at, at sort of where they are in the understudied um, realm of the kinome that we have we and our collaborators have made chemical probes for and we release those to the community. So these are potent compounds at these kinases. They're selective across the kinome. They're active in cells. We've made a negative control that can help understand that the phenotype that they cause is due to the kinase in question. And we share these compounds. But to do this across the kinome is an enormous time consuming task. So our question became, how do we shine light on more dark kinases more quickly? How can, how can we do that? And so this slide really summarizes our strategy. So the situation is, and I haven't gone into this in great depth, but kinases are very interesting uh, uh, protein family that we need to work hard on and continue to work on. Probe, kinase by kinase probe development is gonna take too long. Their phenotypic drug discovery is, is back in the forefront and very important. There are many disease relevant phenotypic assays that are hungry for smart compound sets. And because the, the community has worked on kinase inhibitors for the last 20 years and kinases are connected by virtue of catalyzing the same reaction and, and small molecules can bind into this ATP site, there are numerous thousands, uh, tens of thousands, high quality kinase inhibitors in the literature and in company collections. And what we believe is that we can leverage this data set and this, and this connectivity between kinases and build and share a, a set of narrow spectrum kinase inhibitors that together screens, screened as a group, a well-characterized set of compounds can, en can enable us to understand activity across the kinome. And that's what we call our, our kinase chemogenomic set. And so this is what it would look like. Uh, uh, there, there's a reference on the bottom that I would recommend to you. It's, it's, it's one of the best uh, references on what a chemogene chemogenomic set is and how one would use it. Here's, here's a simple version. You have a phenotypic assay and you have a set of kinase inhibitors that are well characterized. We know which kinases they inhibit. We screen that set of inhibitors against this phenotypic assay and based on the patterns of activity and the annotation of those compounds that are in the screening set, you can understand which kinases impact your phenotype. And then ideally you can choose the right kinase to go after for the right disease. So that's what we set out to do. Uh, one of the first questions we had is, is, is that possible? And this is just a snapshot of some data from a number of years ago where we looked across uh, the literature of our own data and what people have published and looked for selective compounds. And that's shown in the narrow spectrum inhibitor sort of um, black lines at the bottom. And you can see across the, the kinases one to 500 from more study to less studied, what we find is we could identify in the literature or in our own data, selective narrow spectrum inhibitors. So these aren't chemical probes necessarily. They don't inhibit maybe one or two kinases, but maybe inhibit only 10 out of the kinome. So narrow spectrum. Uh, then we looked at what commercial assays there are across the kinome. And, and of course, most of the kinases there are assays for. So 400 to, to but, but maybe 400 or so assays, kinases we can have assays for. So this suggested that one could put a plan in place to identify and gather these compounds and screen them broadly and put a set together. So I'm gonna take one step back now in this slide. So this project has been going on for a number of years and if, you want to sort of track the progress. These are the, the five papers that sort of track from where we started to where we are now. So just last year, we released a, a paper in, in, in 2020 that characterizes this KCGS set that I'm going to tell you about. But it's important to know that there were previous iterations of this set, which we call PKIS and PKIS2. 
which we published on in 2016 and 2017. That becomes important later as I'm telling you about sort of the impact of sharing these compounds and sharing these sets. So, so, so that's why I'm presenting this here. So it's been a, it's been a progression with steadily improving the, the chemogenomic sets that we can share. So this was our plan uh, to build the set. As members of the Structure Genomics Consortium, the SGC, we're very fortunate to have a number of uh, excited and dedicated pharmaceutical company partners who wanted to help us with this, out, with this project. So what we did is if you see the, the sort of charts on the left, of, that's, that's a visualization of the kinome tree, a phylogenetic representation of all the kinases. We looked in our previous two sets called PICUS and PICUS2, and we could find inhibitors uh, for those, uh, for, for some subset of kinases. Once again, in the literature, we could find representation for other kinases. And what we did is we, we, we sort of sifted through these results with the aim of increasing the diversity of our, our, our kinase sets, um, but also only selecting potent and selective inhibitors. So some of our early sets had compounds that were more promiscuous, so we would leave those out in a next generation set. And then what we decided to do is screen those compounds more uniformly in one assay panel, the DiscoverX assay panel, across 400 or so uh, non-mutant human kinases. And if in that screening, the compounds met a certain criteria, that is a, a binding affinity of less than 100 nanomolar on a kinase and a selectivity number, which we call the S10 at one micromolar of less than 0.02. So basically that means it inhibits 2% or binds to 2% or fewer of the kinome than it could go in the set. So the companies on the right and, and non-companies like uh, Professor Nathaniel Gray's lab gave us compounds that we could screen broadly and incorporate into this set. And the, the goal of this project is to, to eventually cover 100% of the kinome and for each kinase have two or three scaffolds, two or three different inhibitors that bind to that kinase. Okay, and so we built the set using that exact methodology that I just described. And so there was a lot of time that passed between, <laughs> between these two slides. But this now is a representation or several representations of what the set looks like. So if you just start with the bar chart, uh, on the x-axis is the list of 188 compounds. Of course, some of the names you don't see because they would be too small. And on the y-axis, you see how many kinases in this 402 kinase panel each compound inhibits. So most of them inhibit six or fewer kinases out of this 400 plus uh, uh, panel. The, the red dots in the middle, once again, this is a, a familiar description of the phylogenetic tree of the kinome, and the red dots represent, uh, we have a show, show that we have a compound that covers those kinases. So what you can see is, is we have really relatively good distribution for the different kinase families. And then finally, the pie chart on the right-hand side of the screen uh, show sort of the provenance of these compounds, where they came from. So about half of the compounds managed to migrate from our first two sets, PICUS and PICUS2. And then the other half of the compounds are sort of new additions from the, from the companies or the, the sources you see, so from Takeda, Pfizer, and so on. And so what's nice about getting compounds from the community is you tend to then see different chemotypes, different scaffolds, and, 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 and also certainly different kinases that those compounds cover. A couple other things I wanna, this is a busy slide, a couple other things I wanna point out uh, if you wanna go back to this slide is on the bottom, you, there's a link to our website where you can find more information about the compounds in the set. There's also a link to a, a site at a company called Zimbio, which is where you can go and you can access the site. There's a fee to buy the set and that fee basically we use to replenish the set and con to continue to optimize the set. So in order for us to distribute this uh, set, we need to make sure we have a supply. And so we've, we've remade all 188 compounds in the set. And so that's the kind of cost that, that uh, gets 
recouped when when people pay to to buy a set to use in your own phenotypic screens. Okay, and I, I just threw this one slide in. It really is similar to what you've seen. The only addition is up at the top, you see uh, this is sort of an IDG symposium. We, we mapped on the, the IDG, so the understudy kinase list for this project. You can see as you would expect, perhaps, they're skewed to the right-hand side of the publication curve. So many of them have very few publications. Um, and it turns out our KCS coverage um, bar chart there, we, we, 32 of the kinases we cover with the KCGS are IDG, so our officially uh, NIH IDG understudied kinases. So these are perhaps tool molecules that can be used to start to understand better the function of these IDG kinases. A few more details about the set for those who are interested. Uh, the, the current set of 188 compounds, we, we bend them into, uh, so, so I'm a medicinal chemist and we think in terms of structures. So we bend them into structures based on the, the part of the molecule that binds to the hinge region of the kinase. And, and this shows that we, th this sort of analysis, we identified 67 different chemotypes that are represented in this set of compounds. Uh, and, and, and really it's a broad range where, you know, some of the most popular chemotypes we have, you know, 10 to 15 compounds, but for many of the chemotypes, we just have one or two examples in the set. Uh, after we built the set, we were able to collaborate with uh, scientists in the Sorger group. And I just want to, I won't go through this in depth, but just to say in, in the publication that describes KCGS, you can find these results. We screened them against 18 mostly cancer cell lines, and that data is shown here. And really there's three, three kinds of compounds we identified. The vast majority of the compounds cause no cell growth phenotype in these cancer cell lines, which, which is kind of what you want if you're gonna again go and use these compounds uh, in, in other sort of cellular models. A subset of the compounds, which you see the sort of the, the, the blown out section on the bottom right, Actually, these compounds had sort of uniform cell growth inhibition activity across this panel. So if you look a little more deeply at these compounds, many of them are perhaps PLK inhibitors or Aurora inhibitors, and they really show a strong phenotype. Uh, there's a very interesting set of compounds on the, in the blowout on the left that show differential activity across this panel of cancer cell lines. So this now is the kind of data that you can dig into to start to say which kinases are causing preferential cell growth in particular cancer cell lines and why might that be true? Okay, so for the remainder of this talk, what I'd like to do is just convince you that, that people are finding this useful and that's why we wanna to continue to build this set and give you some, some examples of how people are using both the compounds themselves and the data that, that we provide with the compounds, so the profiling data. And what we imagined when we started is basically there will be three uses. Chemists like us would look at the compounds and we would use them as starting points to make better compounds, more selective probes for understudied kinases. We also imagined that a lot of computational work would be done with the data set to try and understand how do you model kinases, how do you design uh, new kinase inhibitors. And then of course, our primary goal was to create a set useful for phenotypic screening. So to sort of understand how people have been using the set, we did a couple things. I mentioned this set has been built upon previous sets. So those five papers that I referenced in an earlier slide, we, we looked at everyone who's referenced those papers. And I see already that there's a typo, but those, those papers were referenced 588 times. So we went through those papers and discovered that in 151 of those papers, people either used the compounds in a screen or they used the data in a computational exercise. And so the breakdown of how the sets have been used is shown in the pie chart on the right and the, the numbers on the bottom. So 31% of the uses have been in a phenotypic screen, 
about 20% of the uses have been in computational model development. And 34% and of the people use this set in, a, in an actual target-based screen. Um, so now what I'll do is just tell you a few examples, uh, uh, and I apologize for the wordiness of these slides, but I just wanted to touch on them and you can go back to these if you're interested. So pseudokinases are a very interesting subclass of kinases that don't, uh, don't actually do the enzymology, but they still sometimes bind ligands and bind other proteins and have biological consequences. And it turns out that a number of labs have used this, these sets of molecules to identify ligands for pseudokinases. So MLKL and TRIB1 and TRIB2, for example. And then more recently, we were able to take hits from these sets that bound to the pseudokinase cask. And the paper linked there is the development of, act, of a chemical probe for the pseudokinase cask, which should help uh, the community understand some of cask's functions. Uh, I mentioned about 30% of the people have used the, the set for phenotypic screening. I won't go through this list, but this highlights the type of assays. And the main point I want to make here is the reason for making and distributing a set is so that you can get more people, more smart scientists doing more experiments, right? So any one lab might focus on one or two of these areas, right? They might be interested in a particular rare cancer or a particular signaling pathway having to do with MYC. But when you share these compounds, you get the benefit of multiple people running their screens and you know, putting their brain power behind it. So for example, uh, a lab in the UK was able to show by screening um, KCGS that the inhibitors in the, in the set that uh, inhibited check one, uh, we, they could demonstrate synthetic lethality in, in a range of cancers that show loss of cyclin F. So super interesting to be able to share it and see results from a variety of assays. Uh, the set was built on human kinase inhibitors, but what's cool is uh, the kinomes of other species, kinases are similar across species. So people actually, uh, about 20% of the phenotypic screens people ran were in other organisms, other species. So it, we've identified inhibitors of uh, a, CD, a, a kinase called CDPK1 in T. gondii, so the shown in, in, in box A, for example. Um, people have used the set to look at antibiotic resistance and, and we found inhibitors of the Staph aureus STK1 kinase. So there's lots of cool stuff that people can do with this set. Um, finally, so as a chemist, this is sort of my favorite thing that we do with the set is, I mentioned before kinases are connected, inhibitors of the reason this works is inhibitors of one kinase can be used as starting points to develop inhibitors of another kinase. And here are just five examples where a compound was originally made uh, for one target and, and we or others were able to convert those into uh, a chemical probe for a, for a completely different kinase, often in, in a different part of the kinome tree. So once again, uh, sharing data and uh, allows people to, to, to do these experiments and choose the starting points that are useful for them. Uh, so this is one very specific example. We started with a GSK3 inhibitor that came out of GlaxoSmithKline and we were able to convert it into uh, uh, an inhibitor, a chemical probe for click one, click two, and click four. And that data is summarized here. You see the kinome scan data in the, in the kinome tree plot in the middle where it, you in, we inhibit the clicks and just a few other targets. On the far right, you see the nanobret data showing good target engagement, uh, IC50s for click one, two, and click four. And now this, this compound is, we're using it to try and understand some of the interesting splicing bi biology that the clicks uh, undergo. In my last two slides, I just want to say we're still moving forward. We're trying to make the set better. Uh, I've mentioned the set is 188 compounds. Uh, 
We recently have identified 114 new compounds that, and we have now shipped them to our collaborators in Frankfurt to, to plate out so that we can distribute them as well. I show a few examples here. Um, these compounds are being added because they either inhibit new kinases that the first set didn't, or they add a new structural chemotype to, to cover a, a particular kinase more thoroughly. And then finally, this last slide, uh, this, this, this update of the set moves us from covering 212 kinases to 255 kinases. I think that's about 65% of this screenable kinome. It, it moves our IDG coverage from 32 kinases to 47 kinases. And it also, from 11 of those original 32 IDG kinases, it adds an additional compound that covers that. So finally, this, this has been a really uh, fun and, and, and large project that has spanned years and many people. And this acknowledgement slide really does not uh, do justice to the, to the team, but the multiple SGC sites have contributed um, past and current members of the, the team here at UNC. And really the, the pharma partners who generously gave ideas and time and shipped us compounds and, 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 and allow us to share these freely. And then of course the, the funding agencies. And with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. Right. Thanks, David. It was great. So, um, so yeah. So to get things going, to any questions? I guess they can be done verbally or through chats. Uh, whatever works for people. So, Dave, I have a question. Uh, um, it's really nice talk. Uh, um, so, do you have a for your for your set? Do you have an upper limit? Uh, how many compounds you want to uh, include? Or actually, it you, you and just for. How many compounds feasible to, to screen? Oh, actually, it's just depending on the compounds that are going to be fit in the criteria. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our thinking on that has changed, Jan, through the years. Um, really, we started with a number of, of, you know, 500 in our heads that we, or 500 to 1,000, right? If it's bigger than that, many labs won't want to screen it. But right now, we're really focused on adding compounds as we can and adding compounds that add value. So I think. I think we can get to a set of 500 maybe that that basically gets to where we need to be. As you can imagine, it's going to get harder and harder to fill, to, to find tools as your kinase list gets smaller and smaller because people haven't studied them. For some, there aren't assays and those sorts of things, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks. One thing, David, I was just curious, I'm, I'm assuming it hasn't been done because it's probably not how it was approached, but it would be interesting, um, the targets, right? If, since they they aren't super specific, they have, you know, cross essentially different pathways. And it'd be interesting if, you know, there was some subset that was kind of optimized for almost on the biology side, like you could pick a set that would, um, you know, hit, certain pathways individually or in combination, you know, if there was sort of subsets and I don't, have you guys thought about that at all or? We've thought about it in a slightly different way than you're saying, but I, I, think, I think that idea is a good one. The way we're thinking about pathways now is as a, as a plan for continuing forward, for example, the LKB1 pathway, there are about 15 kinases that are either phosphorylate LKB1 or get phosphorylated by LKB1. And it's a very interesting pathway in on oncology. And so collaborators ask for, you know, do you have a tool for this or a tool for that? And so what we're finding are those themes, like you're saying, those pathways. And it's a way to focus our energy on what would people want? And that, like, that's an example, right? And, but we could easily do what you're saying now and just say, the kinases we cover, where do they fit on pathways? And can you have those subsets that, that would definitely be interesting to subsets of biologists? I, th I think right. you're right. No, I just, yeah. Even with the ones you have, it could be interesting to know, hey, if I chose these five compounds, yes. you know, I'd be, I'd have some different, different views of the same maybe pathway or networks or something like that. Yeah, so. we're, 
a good idea. Another example is splicing kinases. There's a family of, you know, depending on who's counting, 10 to 20 kinases involved in splicing. And some people are very interested in that biology. And so if we could make a toolkit of those, it could be a nice subset. So. Gotcha. And then a quick question for Jen. Um, did you, uh, this whole thing with the AKT, so you needed more, so if there was greater phosphorylation, it would work better, is that correct? And so it, is it strictly just a, you know, you need enough target that's phosphorylated to deal with, or is it other aspects of, you know, you had mentioned that, uh, I guess, BRAF and RAS sort of pathways, you know, depending on their status, that would have an effect as well. Do you, so do you have an understanding, and I may have just missed it, understanding of how that works? No, uh, uh, Sean, this is a great question. And, and yeah, so um, the, um, um, we, don't, we don't know exactly. And, and I think we have some ideas. And, and basically it's like you said, the, um, the level of uh, phosphor AKT matters. And mm -hmm. in the resistant cells, they tend to have a lower phosphor AKT than the sensitive cells, okay? And, and, uh, and then, then um, and, and so why we think actually the, there's possibility uh, and the, the compound actually binds to phosphorylated AKT better than actually inactivate AKT. And because the AZD compound is an ATP competitive compound, it actually it binds to active form. So we have, I didn't show you, we have a thermal shift uh, cell to assay data. Uh, mm -hmm. And indeed, in the compared to cell lines, sensitive cell lines and resistant cell lines. So the same compound and, and does not increase thermal stability in the resistant cell lines, which have a low AKT, uh, a phosphor AKT level, but significantly in increased uh, um, uh, um, stability of the a AKT in sensitive cell lines, which has higher level of phosphor AKT. Okay, right? So then, and that this is one part of it. Another part of it also is the, and not only binding, but also the phosphor AKT or active AKT is in a different conformation. Maybe actually is more, more uh, uh, accessible or readily to form ternary complex with the E3 ligase. Then the, uh, the inactive AKT form may be difficult to form ternary complex formation. Uh, uh, okay, interesting. Oh, neat. Okay, right. I think. Uh, are there other questions I've been? I think there's a question for uh, for, for 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 Dave in the um, in the uh, Q and A session. Okay. Did you, you, uh, so for your case CGS screening criteria, have you looked at the KDs uh, plus and minus ATP as well? That's for, we right. have not, but it's a it's a it's a something I can comment on. So. A limitation, of course, of this set is this is binding data against against in, in a biochemical situation and it's not a cellular readout. So uh, in our lab, we are working to develop nanobread assays, so in cell target engagement, so we can um, understand better permeability and in getting into the cell and competing in, in, the, in the environment in a cell. So some of those experiments are ongoing, but for now, it's, it, you know, the this, this is what you have. And it's, it, we, we have not done the whole panel of screening at various ATP concentrations. So that's a limitation, but I think it still puts us in the, in the ball game. And because most of these compounds came from medicinal chemistry programs, uh, often at big pharma, the, the focus on those programs of course is cellular activity. So most of these compounds uh, will have activity in cells but we don't have the data to back that up on a kinase by kinase basis. Right. Any, any last questions? We've gone slightly over, so maybe last, last one. Oh, no, okay. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, I guess that's it. So once again, thank you both very much for uh, two great talks. That was really interesting. So, um, and thanks everyone else for attending as well as, uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. So.